Dr. Wooler, let's, uh, okay, perfect. So this is Dr. Wooler, I wanna welcome you to another uh, installment of the Great Plains uh, sponsored webinars here. So we're gonna talk about a functional medicine approach to mitochondrial dysfunction, huge topic. I mean, we could, you know, like a lot of these things, we could spend hours upon hours looking at this from different angles. So I'm gonna kind of walk you through some things that I think are interesting when considering mitochondrial issues from a general health standpoint. And then we're gonna talk about lactic acidosis as an angle to take here, particularly when evaluating uh, organic acid tests. So I'm Dr. Kurt Wohler. For those of you who have not uh, heard me before, I've been an integrative and functional medicine physician for over 20 years. Got my start back in 1998 uh, down in San Diego, California. I've been doing a lot of clinical education for Great Plains Lab now for many years, not only doing these monthly webinars, but also doing uh, around the country and around the world speaking on organic acid testing and other topics of integrated medicine, autism, etc. Haven't been doing much in-person speaking of late just because of the whole COVID scenario. Not sure when that's going to return, but uh, hopefully someday we will. Um, I've also, I'm an active clinician. I've written a number of books. I do my own education. So we actually have our own academy called Integrative Medicine Academy with different online courses in integrative medicine. And then I'm also the founder of Functional Medicine Clinical Rounds, which is a uh, uh, website, a membership website, where people, doctors can interact with us directly through um, a one-on-one -on -one consulting service. We also have educational videos and other content. And then I work a lot with the autism population, patients with autoimmune disorders, neurological issues, etc. So when we think about functional medicine, <clears throat> you know, functional medicine, integrated medicine sometimes get intertwined, but Functional medicine is an approach to healthcare that is really looking to try to determine the underlying root cause of illness. I mean, integrated medicine does too, but functional medicine sort of at its uh, you know, initial stages really put a lot of emphasis on detoxification problems. Let me get a different color pen. Digestive issues, hormonal issues, and immune function, how those things relate. And it very much emphasizes how lifestyle, so exercise, sleep, stress management, nutrition and diet, as well as environmental factors, impact upon these core systems in the body. And if we go way back, I mean, I first start, I first got my, my early introduction to these concepts, again, back to the late 90s, actually, when I first attended my first autism conference in San Diego. And then shortly thereafter, I had gone to a conference on, at that time it was termed adrenal fatigue and the whole hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis and started working with a group of docs in the San Diego area talking about this whole subclinical model of uh, healthcare because our medical model is really looking at people who primarily are com coming in with symptoms, and that's primarily who we see in our office as well. But you know, before symptoms ever show up, there's an asymptomatic period, unless it's some kind of acute injury, for example. And dysfunction in the GI system and immune system and detoxification system and hormonal systems will play a significant role in a wide variety of illnesses. So we have to do our due diligence to kind of go back and look at things from a fundamental standpoint. And I've used this slide a lot in my lectures, and that's the chronic stress response. We're all um, vulnerable to this because no matter what kind of stressor we're looking at, whether it's food sensitivity issues or lack of nutrients, malabsorption problems, chemical exposure, heavy metals, physical injuries, head trauma, mental, emotional stress, poor sleep, whatever, it all is signaling through the hypothalamus that then communicates with the adrenal gland to output cortisol. And then over time, we start to run into discrepancies between cortisol and DHEA, 
And then our patients or even us can manifest with dysfunction again at the metabolic level, immune system level. And then we can end up with a host of different diagnoses. So you could pick any one of these and backtrack a lot of things that can go wrong that lead or are linked to this chronic stress response. And oftentimes, I think there's a, uh, and certainly a heavy emphasis on lab testing and supplements and whatnot, which is certainly warranted. But sometimes I think what happens with that is that lifestyle factors, diet, nutrition is somewhat de-emphasized or maybe patients just aren't interested in hearing it. But this is kind of a classic scenario where we can't get away from our lives. Okay, our patients can't get away from their lives. And, and some people handle stress better than others. But in many cases, when you're looking at chronic health problems, whether it's autoimmune problems or chronic GI problems or neurological deficits, chronic fatigue, for example, we're not talking weeks or months of dysfunction. We're talking years from psychological stress to mental emotional stressors to fear to physical body issues, prescription drugs have a significant impact on mitochondrial activity, diet. I mean, I know I sound like a broken record here to many of you who get this concept, but it's so important, I believe, to just keep hammering home this message that a supplement program, okay, isn't going to overcome a lousy diet in that people who have had chronic health problems for years are often not going to feel better in just a few weeks of taking some high-end products. These are processes that unfold over time. Now, I work a lot with the autism population, and one of the things that I really believe is true is that one of the reasons we're seeing such an increase in autism cases is certainly environmental factors. And you can talk about chemicals, you can talk about heavy metals, you can talk about vaccine reactions, which certainly holds true for some. But we're also dealing with, I think, kids and likely a generation, if not generations of individuals that are compromised at a nutrient level. And yes, there are genetic factors, and then we have the epigenetic factors on top of that. But I see a lot of kids who exist in a, I don't even know if I want to call it subclinical, but you know, sometimes just a, a severe deficiency state. And if you think of the autism scenario, many of these kids have very limited diets anyway. And when we go through the rest of these slides, I want you to think about the power of nutrients in what deficiencies of certain nutrients can cause from a metabolic standpoint. Because one thing is true, if you think about the, the cellular energy that has to be produced in our body to create us as human beings is really unbelievable how much has to go right in order for things to come together. And then how much actually has to go right on a moment to moment, uh, hour to hour, day to day, week to week, year to year standpoint to keep things in line. And all of that takes metabolic fuel. On mitochondrial energy, but the mitochondria are also dependent on the things that we put into our body. And then when you think about people who are then in a state of chronic illness, how much metabolic energy has to go into trying to get them well again. So these are things that I, I think about, and I'm always thinking about these with every patient I'm working with. And let's just take a, an example of, I know all of us have studied aspects of the methylation system, and you know, probably some of you have much more experience with this. And there's a lot of emphasis on methylation biochemistry today, and, and for good reason. What sometimes gets missed is that the methylation cycle is linked to the folate cycle, is linked to what's called the BH4 cycle, okay? So all of these systems have an interlinking aspect to them. They're all dependent upon one another. And 
the influence of these can have tremendous effects on all aspects of our body. If we just look at the BH4 cycle, for example, and the production of different neurochemicals from dopamine to tyrosine to tryptophan to melatonin to serotonin, all have a relationship back to these cycles. But these cycles are also dependent in many respects on mitochondrial activity. So there's actually different enzymes that require ATP to help make that conversion happen. And certainly there are many nutrients that are also necessary from B6 to vitamin C to antioxidants. And the methylation cycle is significantly dependent on ATP production. So compromised mitochondrial activity can compromise methylation, which can compromise the folate cycle, which can compromise the biopterin cycle. And sometimes it isn't all about just trying to fit a nutrient into a certain place, but it's trying to look at things globally and understand how lifestyle, diet, nutrition, when these things are abnormal or deficient, affect things on a global level. <clears throat> so the mitochondria don't exist in isolation either. They're obviously center within our cells because of their capacity to produce energy, but they are as vulnerable to things that get generated within our body or things that we come in contact with environmentally as any other cell or organelle, for example, at the cellular level. And so when you see somebody who has a mitochondrial dysfunction or you suspect that they do, you have to at least what I do is pull back and say, well, what are the potential things that could be impacting upon this? Could heavy metals be a problem? Could inflammation, could clostridia, could nutritional deficiencies? And I realize that we can't work on every single one of these aspects at the same time, but what we can do is do some initial investigation and then work on certain factors that have a greater chance of moving things along from a mitochondrial standpoint. Because all of these factors can lead to oxidative stress and oxi oxidative stress is a killer for mitochondrial activity. And when we kill off our mitochondria or we can't regenerate new mitochondria, our ability to make ATP, that cellular energy currency is significantly compromised. So let's look at the basic function of mitochondria. In many of the courses I teach, I talk about the fact that all of our energy systems, or I should say most of them are heading, it's sort of like they're all funneling down to the mitochondrial level. From proteins to amino acids, from carbohydrates to monosaccharides to fats to fatty acids, all funnel into these systems whether they create pyruvic acid, whether they go directly to acetyl coenzyme A, these are entry points into the Krebs cycle to eventually um, spin essentially chemicals through the electron transport chain to produce ATP, that all necessary energy currency chemical that all of us need and many people are deficient in. And so the ATP ADP cycle is important because ATP is that currency. And as it gives off a phosphate, okay, that's when energy gets released from the cell. These things have to be recycled. So ATP becomes ADP, AD, ADP gets recycled to ATP. And we move from catabolic energy producing reactions. So the oxidation, or oxidative metabolism of carbohydrates, fats, proteins, to anabolic reactions, which require energy. So muscle contractions, cellular transport mechanisms, compounds, you know, uh, synthesizing different compounds in the body. Folate, for example, folate absorption is an active process. So, and it requires ATP. Thiamine is also dependent on transporters, which require ATP as well. And one of the things of how I describe to patients the process of burning carbs, fats, and proteins is I give the analogy of, of going on a camping trip, right? So let's say you're out camping and you want to sit around and have a little campfire. 
Well, the first thing you do is you go out and gather up small twigs and dried up leaves. That's your kindling. That starts the flames because it's, it's cheap, easy fuel that starts to burn easily. Well, that's your carbs, right? That's, that's, you get some energy production from carbohydrate metabolism. But in order to get your campfire really going, you need some medium and large size logs, okay? And that would be your fats and proteins. But we need all of it, right? In order to really initiate optimal metabolism. Aerobic respiration is just the, the pure aspect of breaking down glucose in a process of called glycolysis to make pyruvic acid, to convert it to acetyl coenzyme A and then spin it through the Krebs cycle with eventual transport to the electron transport chain. And the electron transport chain is named because you're basically transporting electrons from one complex to the other to cause a gradient effect chemically that ultimately outputs ATP. Okay, so that's a real simplistic way of looking at it. We could get much more complex. We're looking essentially at a larger diagram of the citric acid cycle, also called the Krebs cycle. And every single step from citrate to cis um, uh, aconate to D isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate is dependent on enzymes. And many of these enzymes are dependent on nutrients, various B vitamins, for example. And every single one of these steps is vulnerable to some type of genetic imbalance or some type of epigenetic factor. So heavy metals or chemicals, for example, might be able to interfere with some of these steps. And we know that yeast toxins and other fungal toxins can interfere as well as bacterial toxins. It's a little bit hard to see on this diagram, but you know this diagram does a pretty good job at just kind of showing us what some of the nutrients are that make all of this work. So for example, the first stages of the citric acid cycle, okay, actually require iron and they actually require glutathione because there's a, a very complicated um, iron relationship to the function of those enzymes. And if we don't have good glutathione status, it can actually cause oxidative stress that damages these enzymes. But various heavy metals can interfere from arsenic to mercury. Um, aluminum, for example, can interact at various steps as well. And then we have certain enzyme complexes which require a lot of different nutrients that You'll be surprised many people can be deficient in either because they have a very long standing poor diet or poor absorption within the digestive system. At the electron transport level, so we're basically looking at the mitochondria. So we've got two membranes. We've got an outer membrane and an inner membrane. Here's our Krebs cycle. We're sitting at the matrix within the mitochondria, and right here is our electron transport chain. And there's various complexes that are involved that ultimately lead to ATP production. Things can damage the inner mitochondrial membrane, just like they can damage the outer mitochondrial membrane. So chemical toxins can do that. Um, and, and other factors that increase different types of enzymes called phospholipases that can actually break down these membrane structures. And then we get down to the heart of what's actually happening in the electron transport chain. As I mentioned before, the electron transport chain basically is moving, okay, electrons through these complexes. At the same time, we're getting an exchange of hydrogen and that pumping mechanism basically produces ATP. We can have CoQ10 deficiencies that can compromise this function. We could have problems uh, at what's called nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide that affects these things. 
Uh, and there's other nutrients that are involved as well. And sometimes genetics play a role, sometimes it's just nutritional deficiencies, or sometimes it's just toxins, which are known to adversely affect these complexes. So for example, there are certain toxic chemicals which can damage complex one. Okay, and if we damage complex one of the electron transport chain, we are very compromised as far as our ability to ultimately make ATP. We can still get things in through complex two, but it's not as efficient as it once was. And so the organic acid test is vital, it's critical to learn how to use. And I do a lot of teaching you know, on the oat test, and some of you have probably heard me lecture on this. But the one thing about the oat is it's not just a random collection of markers. It incorporates information that's looking at things from different metabolic levels. And when you learn how to use the organic acid test and understand the relationship between the different sections of the oat and how they relate to each other, it becomes an incredibly powerful tool. And for me, it's always been a fundamental aspect of what I do within my practice. It's one of these tests I try not to let anybody escape from my, from my consultation services of, of try to avoid doing. And I often tell people if they can only afford to do one test in the beginning, for most situations, to me, I would start with the organic acids test. And so let's just take a quick look at an example of the oat that has a relationship to mitochondrial activity, and that would have to do with glycolytic cyclometabolites. That's lactic acid and pyruvic acid. Now, if you've heard me lecture before, you've probably heard me mention that lactic acid has an association with mycotoxin exposure. So if you see elevations of lactic acid, that should be something that you're considering doing either for yourself or for your patient. But we know it doesn't stop there because there could be other reasons that lactic acid is high. In fact, there's many different types of lactic acidosis. Type A lactic acidosis is considered to be much more serious in nature, not something that we would likely see in our functional integrative practices just as general practitioners. So hypovolemic cardiogenic septic shock, for example, things that cause mass hypoxia at the tissue level and hypoperfusion can lead to massive elevations of lactic acidosis. Most of us are dealing with people who are, uh, have what's called type B lactic acidosis. It's being brought on by something else. Certain medications, okay, metformin, for example, actually is a thiamine inhibitor, and that can significantly compromise glucose metabolism, which can lead to lactic acidosis. Thiamine deficiencies, excessive exercise, that I think for many of us who exercise a lot, that's, you, you probably felt that as well. Ethanol intoxication, diabetic ketoacidosis. So one of the things that I'm always doing when I see a test is, you know, I'm, I always talk about clinically correlating it to the type of patient, right? And so this is where you have to get into good history taking and also looking at the age of the individual and all of those factors. Because if I'm dealing with a child that's not on medication, well, I'm not worried about medication-induced lactic acidosis. I'm probably also not real concerned about alcohol intoxication. So lactic acid is an organic acid that all of us produce, and it's a byproduct of glucose metabolism derived from the production of pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid, again, is another organic acid that's linked to glucose metabolism through the glycolytic pathway. Now, pyruvic acid can also go off and become acetylcoenzyme A, which is what we need to enter our Krebs cycle. But acetylcoenzyme A is also linked to fatty acid metabolism. It can be linked to other things as well. If we look at a basic diagram of glycolysis, 
So we start with glucose and we basically convert it to different steps. At one point back in college biochemistry, I had every single one of these pathways memorized. It's not really necessary these days, although it's maybe a point of interest for you. But glucose gets broken down and becomes pyruvic acid. Okay, so that's our, that's our ending point of glycolysis. And of course, we can have deficits along the way. So if we've got an ATP problem, well, that could actually affect the first step of glycolysis. If we've got some type of deficit in niacinamide or ni uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, excuse me, right? Well, that could compromise aspe aspects of glucose as well or glucose metabolism. One interesting little side note to the gly uh, glucose metabolism is at the position of glucose 6-phosphate. And glucose 6-phosphate is pulled in part, right, things are going off in multiple directions into something called the pentose phosphate pathway. And when we think about this functionally from either things you've heard from other practitioners or maybe you've heard from me, if you look at the pentose phosphate pathway system, one of the things it's involved in is purine and pyrimidine metabolism, which I'll show you in a second, has to do with the nucleotides involved in RNA and DNA activity. It produces NADPH. Well, one aspect of NADPH is it's necessary to help reconvert inactive to active glutathione. So the pentose phosphate pathway linked to glycolysis is actually very important in glucose regulation, excuse me, glutathione regulation. So we, it helps us maintain normal levels of active glutathione. And we know that glutathione is very important for detoxification. It's also very important for helping to preserve the health and integrity of our mitochondria. Thiamine, okay, part of this pathway has to do with an enzyme called transketolase. And transketolase is thiamine dependent. So a thiamine deficiency can affect the pentose phosphate pathway, which can affect glutathione recycling, which can affect detoxification capacity, which would affect mitochondrial activity. The other thing that can happen with thiamine deficiency that's affecting this system is it can have an effect on purine and pyrimidine metabolism, which is ultimately gonna affect our RNA and DNA, right? So our RNA is necessary to transcribe the DNA to help us make proteins. So glucose metabolism is all about bringing things down to the pyruvate level. Of course, we know at glucose 6-phosphate, it can go off to, the, to that pentose phosphate pathway as well. So that's important. And as part of glycolysis, we convert pyruvate to acetylcoenzyme A. Okay, and there is some ATP that's produced Basically, we use up a couple ATP in the early stages, we break even at some point, and then we, at the end, we end up with two net ATP. So not much, kind of like the kindling that we would need for, to make our campfire. Well, another really important aspect of glycolysis has to do with this enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase. And pyruvate dehydrogenase is a very, it's a, compli, it's a complex uh, enzyme. And it itself, it requires many nutrients. So it requires lipoic acid. It requires nicotinamide adding dinucleotide. It re requires coenzyme A, which actually comes from uh, other B vitamins like B5. And it requires active levels of thiamine. It even requires sources of B2. So if you have somebody who's longstanding 
poor diet, poor nutritional status, poor gut function, where they're not getting a lot of nutrients, they can severely compromise some of these enzymes. So pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is what helps convert pyruvic acid into acetylcoenzyme A. And there are genetic disorders that affect this enzyme as well. This enzyme complex is also metabolically regulated by other nutrients in the body. So if we actually have good energy reserve, the enzyme activity starts to slow down. But if our energy reserves are low, so let's say our ATP levels are low or our body is needing more ATP to be produced, it will actually stimulate more active pyruvate dehydrogenase. So there's this regulatory system over this, the function of this enzyme. And this enzyme, like other enzymes, is also vulnerable to toxins. Arsenic, for example, can alter it. And the reality is, it's probably other kinds of compounds too. You know, certain fungal toxins and bacterial toxins may also affect these enzymes. The thing is, is that pyruvate dehydrogenase in the complex of nutrients it requires to work, that complex of nutrients is found elsewhere in the body. So alpha ketoglutaric acid dehydrogenase, which sits right here in our Krebs cycle, is also dependent on thiamine, B5, riboflavin, lipoic acid, and I should say here magnesium because thiamine and magnesium go together. So we can end up kind of really decreasing Krebs cycle function, overall mitochondrial activity because of nutritional deficiencies at various levels. And of course, there can be genetic mutations that can occur in some of these enzymes too. Those are less common. Those are more common in what are called inborn errors in metabolism. But again, these systems are, are vulnerable as well to different types of toxins. So it's, it's always thinking about these things clinically. Well, what else may be inhibiting these things from functioning? It gets even more deeper than that. So now, one of the other aspects, we just talked basically about glucose metabolism. Now you bring it down to the level of amino acid metabolism that has an influence through mitochondrial activity. And there's a complex called the branch chain alpha keto acid dehydrogenase complex. It goes by different names. But this is one of the initiating points for breaking down certain amino acids as they funnel into the mitochondria. This complex enzyme, just like alpha keto uh, uteric acid dehydrogenase and pyruvate dehydrogenase, is dependent on the same factors. Thiamine, lipoic acid, B5, B2, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Much of what happens in our digestive system will have an impact on the rest of our body as, as well as what's happening at the cellular level. And there are various what are called anti-nutrients that we consume in our diet or get produced within our digestive system because of various pathogens, for example. So they've known that things like different phenolic compounds, and one of the things we've talked about before when you look at organic acid testing as far as uh, phenols linked to Clostridia bacteria, or other bacteria, they themselves may negatively impact the function of the gut and might even themselves have some inhibiting effect on absorption. Phytic acid, which can be, comes from different types of foods, you know, inhibit zinc absorption, for example. Things that cause damage along the small intestine, so chronic infections, chronic inflammation, bacterial overgrowth, fungal issues, celiac disease, okay, inhibit absorption. And then different types of food substances like lectins, for example, can also compromise digestive capacity. And remember, some of these nutrients like thiamine have, actually have to be actively transported into the body. 
mycotoxins come up a lot when we talk about negative impacts on the gut and then negative impacts on cellular function with regards to mitochondrial activity. There are certain mycotoxins, for example, that are major impactors on mitochondrial function like gliotoxin. But some of these mycotoxins themselves will diminish nutrient absorption or just alter the structural configuration within the digestive system. So when you're looking at somebody who has a mitochondrial issue from a functional medicine standpoint, another thing to keep in mind is, is there a possibility of mycotoxin exposure? So if we look a little bit deeper, right? So we're not really gonna talk about these up here, okay, the, the type A lactic acidosis. Um, we'll focus a little bit on some of the maybe the more common ones, the, the type B lactic acidosis. So thymine plays a role. Various medications, okay, will impact mitochondrial activity. Diabetic ketoacidosis and, and certainly ethanol intoxication for people who have long-standing alcohol use. Many times they end up with thiamine deficiencies or they just have poor gut function. So lactic acidosis is what's called a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Basically, that's just a calculation between um, uh, uh, CO2, potassium chloride in the body. But basically, this gets produced or occurs because of an overproduction of lactic acid. We, we've already looked at a few of the reasons. Okay, we're not going to talk much about delactic acidosis that's linked to a short bowel syndrome. So let's just kind of focus on what's most common. So we know that the type A version is most serious, right? Hypovolemic shock, cardiac insufficiency, septic shock, you know, ischemia, you know, these types of things. Type B is something that we would more likely see. Okay, that could be from vigorous exercise, that could come from different medications, for example, that affect blood sugar metabolism or affect liver function. We know that thiamine deficiency, we know that mold exposure can be linked to this type of lactic acidosis. And so when you, when you look at acidosis in general, right, we're basically either retaining or producing too many acids. We're holding on to too many hydrogens as opposed to hydroxyl groups. And so the, the pH of the system becomes more acidic. And if you look at the pH of blood, roughly at about 7.4, so an acidic type of environment would be less than that. So seven being, being essentially a neutral, we've got an equal amount of hydroxyl uh, with an equal amount of hydrogens. So in an acidic situation, our pH is on the lower end of the scale. And we know that lactic acidosis can, again, occur for, for many different reasons. Acidosis in general, can occur from different disease conditions as well. So renal diseases, for example, and then you know what's actually relatively common, depending on the patient population you work with, is diabetic ketoacidosis. So amino acid metabolism into the mitochondria is very important as another aspect of producing ATP, because if you break it down again, between the whole campfire scenario, you've got your kindling, which is your carbs, then you've got your medium-sized to large-sized logs, which are your protein and your fats. Well, another aspect of this is, is protein or amino acid metabolism at the mitochondrial level. And things like leucine, valine, and isoleucine, which are called branched-chain amino acids, are also at, through their metabolism, end up producing acetylcoenzyme A. But they can also produce other types of ketogenic compounds. And this is where people who are on a ketogenic diet, for example, will often produce a lot of organic acids such as acetoacetic acid or something called beta-hydroxybutyric acid. <clears throat> 
So if you've looked at the organic acid test on page three, you know there's three sections that link to mitochondrial activity. You've got the glycolytic metabolites, you've got the Krebs cycle metabolites, and the last one is the amino acid mitochondrial markers. And sometimes you'll see these elevated and sometimes you'll see them quite elevated. And biochemically, it gets a little, you know, a little complicated, but every single step requires a different converting enzyme. And on the GPLO, you know, they will list certain ones that are actually linked or are most commonly seen with different types of enzyme deficits. Okay, but also remember that each one of these steps okay, can be influenced either genetically and possibly, and I say possibly because not everything is 100% defined, but possibly by other factors. This is why oftentimes when you look at an organic acid test and you see some of these markers elevated in those mitochondrial sections, but your patient also has a lot of fungal problems, a lot of bacterial issues, maybe even oxalates, and you work on those, uh, those fungal issues, bacterial issues first, sometimes you'll see many of these mitochondrial markers normalize on their own. So something is interfering with their function, creating kind of a log jam effect. Now, some of these slides actually come from um, one, a few of the lectures I do in my advanced oat mastery course. But if we follow this through, it's, it's very, very interesting because amino acid metabolism, specifically with leucine, okay, as you can see, will help to produce acetyl coenzyme A. Okay, so this is important from an energy metabolism standpoint. It can produce other organic acids that are necessary as backup fuel sources as well. So acetoacetic and beta hydroxybutyric. But isn't it interesting that it also has an influence on cholesterol? And in addition to that, the funneling down biochemically produces ubiquinone. Well, ubiquinone is important for CoQ10 levels within our mitochondria, okay, because the CoQ10 is part of the electron transport chain. And so if we have some kind of block that's occurring either higher up Right, so branch chain amino acid amino transferases, right? Right there, that enzyme complex is dependent on thiamine, magnesium, B2, B5, lipoic acid, or we've got different kinds of genetic blocks along the way that ultimately can affect things that are happening way down here at an energy substrate level, including what's happening at the mitochondrial level within the electron transport chain, which ultimately then leads to problems in ATP production. Okay, so a lot of things can impact, obviously, on the mitochondria. Fatty acid metabolism is another area to look at, and this is another area on the OAT test that's important to understand because the fatty acid section has a strong relationship to what's found on, so basically the fatty acid sections on page four, what's, and then the mitochondrial sections are found on page three. So ketosis, right, whether somebody is inducing ketosis through diet or prolonged, you know, somebody in starvation mode, for example, or fasting, or somebody in a diabetes type of situation needs fuel sources coming from other areas. So we're not really getting it from glucose, okay? But we need, we can get it from fat. <clears throat> so the liver will start to convert, okay, compounds from fatty acids, or basically they can start, we can start to make acetyl coenzyme A, for example, from fatty acids or amino acids and make ketones. <clears throat> 
right? So in this particular example, we've got fatty acid that breaks down into acetyl coenzyme A. We know it can go over into the Krebs cycle and that can lead to ATP production. But what happens if this pathway is altered? Well, we still need energy. And what, what in our body needs a lot of energy? It's our brain or nervous system. In fact, if you look at the metabolic needs in the body, the brain and nervous system has the highest demand okay, of any system. The cardiovascular system requires a lot too, as well as our digestive system. And if you take this even further and think about people who have um, you know, just poor ability to cope with various mental emotional stressors or are manifesting with um, neurological types of problems or perhaps manifesting with dysautonomic type of scenarios where the autonomic nervous system is compromised, in many cases they're, they're dealing with energy production problems. Because even the autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system requires a tremendous amount of metabolic energy to function properly. So as we move fatty acids, okay, will eventually produce acetoacetic hydroxybutyric acid, for example, and these are measurable on the organic acid test will also produce at times acetone. So if you look at the fatty acid section on the oat, you'll see scenarios where 42 and 43 are elevated. And sometimes you'll see other things that are elevated too, but maybe not all that elevated. In this particular scenario, we can see we've got methyl succinic, adiptic, and subaric. That's, those, those are sort of mildly high. But our 3-hydroxybutyric and our acetoacetic are very high. So what is it? Is this a person with diabetes, prediabetes? Are they on a ketogenic diet? Do they have poor absorption? Are they dealing with some kind of carnitine deficiency, for example? Well, some of that can be acquired through you know, clinical history, a history taking good examination. So the breakdown of fat, okay, will ultimately lead to acetoacetate, also called acetoacetic, and it will lead to beta hydroxy butyric acid or also called 3-hydroxybutyric acid. The acetone that gets produced, I actually had a console a couple of weeks ago in a child that had uh, acetone breath smell. Their, their breath smelled like nail polish. And their oat was reflective of that. Okay, so they were in a ketosis type of scenario, but they were not on a ketogenic diet. So something is affecting glucose metabolism. And so they're having to convert substrate in the body in order to produce energy elsewhere. And what is very common in a lot of kids is, is a either some kind of genetic defect of the pyruvate dehydrogenase or a combination of factors, either genetic problem in that enzyme along with nutritional deficiencies. Okay, so this is just another view here of our 3-hydroxybutyric, our acetoacetic, these then getting used, coming from the liver, and then becoming a fuel source elsewhere in the body, particularly the brain or nervous system. Now, this reaction can be induced from somebody doing a ketogenic diet as well. So 3-hydroxybutyric, okay, the first marker in that section of the fatty acid metabolism, hold on a sec. Yeah, it's the first marker. So 3-hydroxybutyric and acetoacetic. Okay, is released and then used as a, a source of fuel for the brain and nervous system. But 
it can be produced too because of some kind of blockage that may be occurring elsewhere in glucose metabolism primarily. It is also a marker that can be used to monitor diabetic ketoacidosis. So you might be looking at somebody who is either diabetic by history, or you might need to actually look at them and make, make sure they're not diabetic. They may not know it, for example. You might be picking up on something on the oat test where this is a person who's in a prediabetes state, for example. Acetoacetic okay, is also linked to these pathways. So basically for the, much of the same reasons as the 3 hydroxybutyric is. And that the acetoacetic is what gives us that acetone. Not everybody's gonna have acetone nail polish breath. This particular child does. And so we're actually looking at things and investigating things. What's kind of interesting about that scenario is they had seen a neurologist. Um, they had done genetic testing. There was an MRI that was done, but nobody's ever done an organic acid test. So that's what we're looking at now. Okay, so that has to do with aspects of fatty acid metabolism. So let's bring this back now to the discussion that we had earlier about the different components of the methylation cycle, folate cycle. And we already know that this biochemical system at many steps, for example, is dependent on ATP. So for example, the conversion of methionine to SAMI is an ATP dependent state or, or, or uh, reaction. Here's our folate cycle. Here's our methylation. And below the line is transsulfuration. And when we start thinking about things that can happen from a functional medicine standpoint, when we start looking at these different areas, we know that there are cofactor steps that are required for all of these enzymes. Okay, so B12, for example, is necessary to convert homocysteine to methionine. We have other vitamins like B2, for example, which are important for converting. It's not really inactive, but it's less active form of folate to active folate. B6 is required for various aspects of our transsulfuration pathway. And we also know that these areas in the methylation transsulfuration pathway can be compromised by various toxins. So for example, the complex of methylcobalamin and methionine synthase is very vulnerable to oxidative stress, inflammation, heavy metals, as well as ethanol. So somebody who's consuming a lot of alcohol can suppress their methylation cycle by suppressing methionine synthase activity. That can also be seen in people who have major overgrowth of yeast and candida because the end product of yeast metabolism of glucose is, is ethanol. Also, we produce a lot of aldehyde in, in a specific compound called acetaldehyde is also an inhibitor of methionine synthase. And then right here below this line is our transsulfuration pathway. Right, so one of the things that gets produced in transsulfuration is glutathione. And when the body is under demand because of toxins, we need more glutathione in order to help try to preserve cellular function. And one of the things that can happen, you see it on the oat test, is an increase in 2-hydroxybutyric acid. So that's a common scenario increased demand for glutathione, it causes a pull on homocysteine, okay, and we end up getting increasing amounts of 2-hydroxybutyric acid. So when you look at an oat test and you look at the interpretation section, 
it'll, you know, number one is that the most common reason that 2-hydroxybutyric is high is an increased need to preserve glutathione, but there are other steps along the way as well. So look at this scenario. We've got elevation of 2-hydroxybutyric, but our pyroglutamic is normal. So if you've heard me lecture before, you know that pyroglutamic, when it's elevated, would indicate a deficiency of glutathione. In this case, it's normal. So there is no glutathione deficiency. So why is the 2-hydroxybutyric elevated? Well, maybe there's some, you know, some toxin or various toxins that's inducing the body to try to maintain the glutathione levels. That certainly is possible. But there could be another reason that 2-hydroxybutyric is also high. Okay, and that is the onset of diabetes. Alcohol use could also be, but let's look at it from a glucose standpoint. 2-hydroxybutyrate um, or 2-hydroxybutyric acid is actually an early marker for both insulin resistance and impaired glucose regulation. So it's often found in people who are dealing with lactic acidosis, and it's been seen in more severe states of acidosis called diabetic ketoacidosis. And so it's actually a marker for impaired glucose tolerance. And so when you look at an organic acid test, it's not just hyper-focusing on one marker, but it's looking at all of the markers and, and lining them up and looking at relationships in the context of your patient. So this is actually somebody who has a history of early onset diabetes. And so we not only have a lactic acid elevation, okay, which we know can occur. Yes, it could be from mold, for example. Yes, it could be from vigorous exercise, doubtful in this person. Um, in fact, it wasn't the scenario. And there's other reasons it might be high too, but we have very high levels of the 3 hydroxybutyric and the acetoacetic. So basically, we're getting some kind of problem within glucose metabolism. Okay. We're also now starting to break down fat and protein, which is leading to increases of 3 hydroxybutyric and acetoacetic. Notice also that suberic is elevated. Now, suberic is often elevated because of an overnight fast, but it comes from oleic acid, and oleic acid is the main form of, of fat stored in our adipose tissue. So it may be that this person's getting a release of the suberic because the body is accessing fat stores in order to try to, you know, increase these ketones for metabolic energy within the brain and nervous system, okay? And we can also then look at this 2-hydroxybutyric down here, perhaps not necessarily something that's linked to glutathione deficiency, but is actually linked itself to impaired glucose tolerance and, and uh, insulin resistance, because that in conjunction with the fatty acid metabolites, in conjunction with the suberic, as well as being a contributing factor to acidosis, is what fits the clinical scenario in this particular patient. Okay, so this was just an article talking about the 2-hydroxybutyric, also called alpha-hydroxybutyric, as a marker of glucose intolerance. So that is just an example, at least how I work things through from a functional integrative medicine standpoint in looking at the clinical history, looking at a given patient's presenting symptoms, correlating information off their organic acid test, and then making decision points about where to go from there. And if we take the scenario of diabetes, right, the vast majority of diabetes, particularly in this country, 
is lifestyle induced. It's not to say that there aren't other forms, right? Type one, for example, but type two is very much linked back to lifestyle issues from lack of exercise to poor eating habits to poor nutrient status, et cetera. You pile on top of that chronic alcohol use or other chronic infections, and you start to create a nutrient deficient type of state that for many people exists for years and years and years to eventually where things start to break down and manifest in many cases as serious illness. Okay, so that, that's my information here is just kind of an example of a functional medicine approach thinking about mitochondrial issues. Um, we actually talk about these concepts in our essential organic acid mastery course, what's called the essential oat mastery course. This course is about the fundamentals of recognizing the most common markers seen on the oat test and then looking how to interpret them, how to clinically apply them, and looking at other segments on the oat. We actually have a new version of the essential oat mastery course starting on Monday, August 17th. So if that's of interest to you, there's a website, essentialoatmasterycourse.com. You can also text EOAT to 66866 and get some uh, uh, downloadable information on the Essential Oat Mastery Course too. Now, some of this information I presented here comes from a few of the lectures that I have in my Advanced Oat Mastery Course. Uh, and this course is available now. We're actually currently in the middle of it, but people can join it at any time. Um, and you can get more information about the advanced Oat Mastery course at AOAT, texted to 66866. The recommendation is, is the advanced Oat Mastery course is really for people who've been through some type of training on the organic acid test from Great Plains Lab or you've been working with the OAT test in your practice for quite a while, feel pretty confident with the fundamental information and you wanna take it to another level. So the advanced OAT mastery course is an advanced level as far as information goes on the use of this test. Also, if you are interested in interacting with me one-on-one -on -one, as well as my partner, Dr. Trancatella, we have a website called Functional Medicine Clinical Rounds. This is for healthcare practitioners. So we provide one-on-one -on -one, uh, consulting and mentoring through this service where people can schedule with us on a week-to-week -week basis if they like to go over lab testing, um, case reviews, clinical troubleshooting, we also have monthly uh, clinical, what's called a clinical rounds, where we go through lab tests or present a specific case history of uh, various topics. And then we've got videos that are also being created on a bi-weekly basis, lab reviews, case studies, um, research article discussions. Uh, and then we're adding new content to this all the time. So functionalmedicineclinicalrounds.com. It is a membership site. You can get more information at that website. There's also a forum, so people can interact with us directly through an online forum as well. So all of our clinical rounds, by the way, are recorded and held within the website along with the videos, and you can actually book consults with us through this website too. For those who are needing assistance in ordering organic acid tests or other labs from Great Plains, and there's other labs that are also offered through this website called Lab Test Plus, you can get a complete list of labs. Every lab comes with a uh, written interpretation of relevant markers. So for more information, you can go to labtestplus.com. And then I'm also available for private consultations. So through my private practice, you have a there's my phone number. Our email is the best way to contact us at scmedicalcenter at gmail.com. And our practice website is mysunrisecenter.com. So the way this works, if any of you submitted some questions, Great Plains will send those to me, usually within a day or two. I'll do my best to answer um, some of them, you know, be back via email. Sometimes the questions are, you're fairly complicated and I, I can't, you can't get 
into a, a real in-depth, but I'll, I'll do my best to answer your questions as best as possible. Okay, everybody, thanks so much for your attention today. I appreciate it. I'm Dr. Kurt Wohler. Take care. Have a good day.